Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this talk. My name is Sagar Patwardhan. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, at Yelp. I'm part of the distributed systems team, and I've been working at Yelp for the uh, last two and a half years. So today I'm going to talk about Siegel uh, distributed fault tolerant concurrent uh, task runner that we built to mainly uh, run our tests uh, in parallel. So let's talk a little bit about Yelp. So Yelp is a mobile app and a website uh, that connects people with great local businesses. So it's basically a search engine where you can find um, whatever you're looking for, a restaurant, a dentist, a doctor maybe. Um, to give you a sense of how big we are, we have 28 million uh, mobile web users. Um, these are the monthly active uh, unique visitors that we get. We have 74 million mobile web users and 83 million um, desktop web users. So we're pretty big. Um, so in today's talk, what I'm, gonna, what I'm going to cover is uh, what is Siegel, why we built it. Uh, I'm also going to give a comprehensive overview of Siegel, how it works, so deep dive into Siegel. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the cluster autoscaler that we built at Yelp. Uh, next thing will be challenges and lessons learned. Uh, and last thing will be the future of Siegel. So uh, let's get started. Um, to give you a, a little overview of testing at Yelp, um, we have uh, 100,000 tests that we need to run in order for our developers to push uh, code to prod. Uh, we have a monolithic application um, which has a lot of tests, and we also have um, service-oriented architecture and uh, over 150 um, services. So if you execute these tests serially, it will take you two days to complete all these tests. So uh, we can't really waste that much time on uh, testing. We have uh, north of 500 developers, uh, and testing kind of has a direct impact on developer productivity. The more time we spend in testing, the less productive our developers are. Um, so Siegel to the rescue. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's a distributed fault tolerance system, uh, which runs tasks in parallel. So uh, to give you a sense of how big Siegel is, uh, we uh, usually have 350 Siegel runs every day. An average runtime for each Siegel run varies between 10 to 15 minutes, depending on what kind of tests we are running. Uh, we spin up 2.5 million ephemeral Docker containers just for the testing use case. These containers are basically different services at Yelp. Uh, developers want to test their service against uh, different services, so uh, we spin up a lot of containers. We use uh, cluster autoscaler, so our cluster is always varying in size. So at night, when uh, the load on our cluster is minimum, we have 70 instances. And our scale, uh, our cluster goes up to 450 instances during peak time, which is in the afternoon US time. Uh, we have started using spot instances. Um, so uh, initially, we started off with RIs and spot instances. Uh, now we are just using spot instances. Uh, every day, Siegel uh, executes 25 million tests. Um, it's basically to ensure that uh, developers are pushing code that is OK to push to prod. So let's talk about applications of Siegel before diving into Siegel itself. So mainly, it was written for the testing use case uh, to run tests in parallel. But we have extended it to uh, different use cases. So um, we have a load testing framework called Locust. This framework is mainly used for uh, testing different endpoints of services. So let's say you are a service owner and you want to say uh, you want to see how many requests per second you can sustain for a certain endpoint of your service. You would use this framework and make a parallel calls to your service and see uh, if it can sustain the sustain the load. Uh, next use case is photo classification. So Yelp has tens of, tens of millions of um, high quality photos, and we use deep learning to figure out whether a photo was taken inside a restaurant whether it was taken outside a restaurant, whether it contains food, whether it contains drink, et cetera. So we, use, uh, we uh, train the model, and then we uh, basically use that model to classify photos on Siegel. So initially, we used to run uh, this on Spark, uh, but now we have migrated it to uh, run on Siegel. And we uh, run classifiers on uh, close to 90 million photos in less than a day. Um, so let's talk about uh, Siegel. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a uh, testing workflow, and then I'll go into specifics about the each each section. So let's say you are a developer at Yelp, and you have uh, created your branch, you have committed your code, and you want to run tests. The first thing you'll do is you'll use a command line tool called run Siegel. 
uh, you'll specify which branch you want to test and which test suites you want to run. Uh, after starting a Seagull run, we start a build on Jenkins. Uh, we do that mainly because there are certain things that need to happen before we can start executing tests on your branch. So one of the first things is uh, we create an artifact. Um, so we pull your uh, pull, pull developers git branch and then basically create a tarball, um, do a bunch of things, and upload it to S3. This is later used by executors to run tests. Uh, the next thing we do is we need to figure out how many tests are there in your branch. So we run a job called test discovery. This job goes ahead and basically calculate, uh, basically figures out how many tests are there in your branch. Um, so um, next thing uh, that we do is, as I mentioned before, we run tests in parallel. So we need to split these tests into smaller chunks or bundles, as we call them. Um, so we run a program called uh, Bundle Creator, which uh, divides these tests into uh, multiple bundles. Uh, after doing that, we start the Seagull Mesos scheduler, um, which talks to Mesos Master, and it basically gets offers from different agents in our cluster. Uh, after getting all the offers, we um, start uh, sending uh, executors to the agents. Um, uh, first thing agents do is they uh, download the artifact that we uploaded in previous stage, um, and they uh, un untar the untar the file. They uh, compile PYC files and start executing tests. After all the tests are done, uh, the results are reported to Elasticsearch and Kibana, which is our main data store for storing test results. Uh, one thing that uh, Siegel Executor does, uh, apart from reporting results, is uh, upload standard error, standard out of each executor. So uh, this is mainly used for debugging. So we uh, direct standard out, standard error to a specific file called Siegel log, and we upload it to S3 at the end of each Siegel run. Uh, we have a uh, we also report a real-time uh, metrics to SignalFX and DynamoDB uh, from our scheduler. Uh, we have a UI service called Test Results. This is mainly used by developers to see results of their uh, tests, whether all the tests in their branch are passing or not. Um, and yeah, that's like a complete overview uh, of Siegel. So this is specifically for the testing use case. Depending on uh, the use case, workflow will vary. So now I'll talk about um, specific sex, uh, specific uh, specifics of Siegel. So first is Siegel Mesos Scheduler. Uh, so the scheduler itself is written in Python. We are currently using libmesos to talk to uh, Mesos. We have not uh, migrated to HTTP API yet. Uh, we have uh, one scheduler per uh, test suite. As I mentioned before, there are different test suites uh, at Yelp. For example, unit tests, acceptance tests, integration tests, uh, Selenium tests, etc. So each uh, test suite is um, it, it basically corresponds to a Mesos scheduler. So at peak time, we have more than 50 schedulers running. So we rely on uh, Mesos' DRF algorithm to uh, distribute offers to us. And so far, it has worked really well. We have never run into an issue where a scheduler is starving for offers or a scheduler is getting a lot of offers. Um, Siegel also has customizable concurrency. So because it is supposed to run batches, you can either run your batches uh, really quickly by setting the concurrency to a very high number, or you can reduce the concurrency and let your branch, uh, let your batch run for a really long time. Siegel scheduler is also fault tolerant, so it can deal with agent failures, it can deal with bundle failures, um, it basically retries bundles, and I'll talk more about the retrying strategy. Um, let's talk about placement strategies. Um, so basically, the aim here is to optimize for Siegel uh, bundle setup time. As I mentioned before, each executor has to download a uh, tarball from S3. Uh, the tarball is typically uh, a few GBs. And we also have to do some um, things before running tests, like compile uh, Python files, etc. So um, to uh, optimize for Siegel bundle uh, setup time, we use two strategies. One is affinity for slaves. So we, if we have uh, used uh, any particular Mesos agent before, we'll try to use the agent again so that the executor tarball is already available and ready to use for uh, the new executor that is getting scheduled. And the other thing is we use as many offers, uh, as many uh, resources in an offer as possible. So if you get an offer with, let's say, 30 CPUs, uh, 200 gigs of memory, we'll try to fit as many Siegel executors into that offer as possible. 
Siegel is supposed to be a batch runner, so it's really uh, time flexible. There's no upper bound on when a Siegel run should finish. It's OK if our Siegel run gets delayed by a minute. Uh, if if an uh, agent goes down and we lose all the executors on that agent, we'll reschedule them and they'll finish uh, in a few minutes. Um, this also simplifies scale down because we are uh, using up all the resources that are offered to us. We are always left with a few idle agents in our cluster, which can be terminated without causing any dis disruption in our cluster. Um, so this uh, UI here is what we call bundle visualizer. So y-axis is the time scale, and x-axis is basically bundles. So the green bundles are the ones that have finished successfully. The red ones are the ones that have failed. So let's say a bundle fails. Uh, what we do is we split the bundle into two bundles of equal size. So let's say if a bundle is of 10 minutes worth of tests, then we'll split it into two bundles, each of five minutes. This is to basically make sure that we are finishing within a reasonable time. We don't want to. Uh, schedule the bundle again and spend 10 minutes on that bundle. Um, Siegel executor. So um, see, we have written a custom executor in Python. Uh, this executor is currently using Mesos Containerizer and different C group isolators. Uh, the main job of this executor is to do setup and teardown. So setup, as I mentioned before, is basically getting the tarball. And the teardown is reporting a bunch of stats. Uh, apart from setup teardown, it also reports uh, utilization of our process. So we run a thread in that executor, which is constantly getting CPU metrics, memory metrics, um, net, how many ne uh, network connections we're using, disk usage, et cetera. Uh, we use that to allocate resources to uh, our uh, Mesos bundle. Um, it also uploads log, log files to S3 and reports uh, test results. Uh, we also have special constraints to run uh, these tests. We have some resources that we call them cluster-wide resources. These resources are not tied to a particular agent. So uh, the typical example of these resources is Selenium connections and database connections. Uh, we want to allocate them uh, without, uh, without uh, tying them to specific agents. So to achieve this, we use Zookeeper, uh, ephemeral Znodes. So there are two uh, Z nodes in our Zookeeper cluster. One keeps track of how many connections you can use, and the other acts as a parent node for uh, ephemeral child Z nodes, uh, children Z nodes. Uh, so basically, uh, let's say you are an executor and you want to use a Selenium connection. You'll first check what is the limit on number of connections, let's say, for Selenium. Then you will uh, query get children on the parent Z node and see how many uh, ephemeral Z nodes already exist. If it is less than the limit, then you will create a Z node and use a Selenium connection. Uh, same goes for database connections. Uh, we use uh, Zookeeper locks to make sure that you know, our access is atomic and uh, we are not running into any race conditions. Uh, as you may know, uh, once the executor goes away, these ephemeral uh, Zookeeper connections will be uh, removed and will basically reclaim the resource at that point. Um, Let's talk about monitoring and alerting. So we have real-time monitoring and alerting using SignalFX. So we send time series data to SignalFX, and they visualize uh, the data for us, and they also provide alerting. So the graph that you see here is uh, representing the number of bundles that have failed in the last one day. So green bars are uh, corresponding to finished bundles. Uh, red bars are the bundles that have failed. Blue uh, bars are the bundles killed and yellow bars are uh, the bundles lost. Uh, for each bundle in Siegel, we specify a runtime. So for example, for a test use case, we uh, specify the runtime equal to 30 minutes. So if a bundle goes over 30 minutes, we go ahead and kill the bundle, assuming there's something wrong with the, with the bundle. Uh, we also do log aggregation in Splunk. As I mentioned before, we upload a, st a standard error and standard out of each executor to S3. We then ingest all this data into Splunk. And we basically query uh, Splunk to get statistics across multiple Siegel runs and uh, across the cluster. So in this example, I'm searching for Yelp serializable uh, object validation error. So uh, it's basically showing us when it happened in the last four hours. Uh, this has been really uh, helpful in debugging cluster-wide issues. So we have better instrumentation of what's going on. 
Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we split tasks, our tests, into multiple chunks. So uh, to do so, we use two different algorithms. Uh, first is a greedy algorithm, which is basically a bin packing algorithm. We uh, keep track of test timings. So whenever a test is executed, we store how long it took to execute, and we upload it to Elasticsearch. We then run a nightly cron job, which calculates P90 for last one week for each individual test, and it uploads it to DynamoDB. And uh, this data is basically used for bundling. So when we are creating chunks, we sort the test list, test list and we basically split the tests into bundles of 10 minutes. Um, this algorithm has worked really well for us. Uh, we've also tried different uh, linear programming algorithms, but the gain that we get with those algorithms is not uh, significant. Uh, so in our Selenium test suite, there are a bunch of constraints for executing tests. So some tests have to be executed together, while some tests can not be executed together. So uh, to achieve that, we have written a pulp LP solver. Uh, so this is a really simple solver, which has three main goals. One, to make sure that a single test is present in a single bundle. Bundle never uh, goes about 10 minutes. And number of bundles created is uh, as minimum as possible. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, we use uh, an autoscaler for our cluster. You must be wondering why it's a bad system. Why do you care? Um, so this is the weekly usage trend of our cluster. So during weekends, the cluster is at minimum scale. Uh, on Mondays, it scales up uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and I, it again, the, the resource utilization goes down. So all the dollars that you see here is the money that we save. Um, same goes for daily usage trend. So we have developers in Europe, which uh, they basically push code in the morning US time, uh, 3 AM, et cetera. And during US office hours times, uh, the cluster utilization goes up. You can also see a spike during lunch hour. So the utilization goes down during that time. Um, so uh, this is the overall architecture of our uh, autoscaler, FleetMiser. So there are two components of FleetMiser. One basically gathers uh, data from Mesos and other, uh, other sources. And it stores the data into Elasticsearch and DynamoDB. Uh, we use uh, SignalFX and Sensu for monitoring the autoscaler itself. Um, so it, it emits uh, useful data regarding when it took a particular decision, what were the, what were the, what did the cluster look like, and why it took a particular decision. Uh, and it basically uh, queries Amazon API to uh, scale up or scale down the cluster. Um, so the auto-scaling strategies that we use are, we use two different strategies, CPU utilization and Siegel runs in flight. So CPU utilization, our, our workloads are CPU bound. So we always uh, run out of CPUs before memory. Um, so we track CPU utilization. And if uh, the CPU utilization goes above uh, 65%, uh, for the last 15 minutes, then we scale up the cluster. And while scaling down, uh, we check if the cluster utilization is below 35% for 30 minutes. If it is, then we uh, scale down the cluster. Um, this signal was added uh, last year. Um, so we basically, whenever a new Siegel run is triggered, uh, Autoscaler gets notified that a run is in flight. So this has helped us a lot. Uh, to give you an example, let's say we are about to scale down. Our cluster has been idle for last 30 minutes. But all of a sudden, developers in EU come along and um, send a bunch of Siegel runs. So our autoscaler anticipates how many Siegel runs are in flight and how many resources they'll need. And depending on that, it either prevents the scale down so, uh, or adds more resources uh, if needed. Um, scaling down is difficult, uh, so we have uh, implemented placement strategies to allow smooth uh, scaling down. Uh, we also uh, use uh, AWS Spot Fleet, and one disadvantage of that is that we cannot specify which instances to terminate. So our autoscaler uh, queries each individual Mesos agent and figures out how many tasks it is running. And if a particular agent is not running any tasks, then it will select that instance for termination and it will go ahead, terminate the instance, and then readjust the spot fleet capacity. This is to basically trick spot fleet into thinking that you know, 
Um, we have terminated the instances that we want. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we use spot instances. So back in May of 2015, we were using a combination of RIs, which are reserved instances, and on-demand on instances. We slowly started ramping up on spot instances. And you can see in July 2015, we saw a 55% reduction in cost. Uh, and uh, we started uh, using all spot instances around December of 2015. And the utilization or uh, the cost of the cluster has goes, gone down 80%. So that's a huge amount of saving. Um, now I'll be talking about some uh, challenges that we faced while uh, building the system and the solutions that we came up with. Um, so first issue we ran into was bandwidth uh, while talking to S3. So uh, our, uh, we are using NAT boxes to talk to S3, and there's limited bandwidth uh, that NAT boxes have. So uh, we also use uh, Docker images, which are backed by S3 uh, buckets. Uh, so uh, we had to uh, come up with, an, with a way to kind of avoid talking via NAT, NAT boxes. So um, basically, the, uh, the solution here was to use VPC S3 endpoints. Uh, they provide fast and secure access to uh, AWS S3 uh, without any bandwidth limitation. All the S3 uh, limitations are enforced, but in terms of bandwidth, there are, uh, they don't Im impose any restrictions. Uh, and one good thing here is that your traffic never leaves Amazon network. Your traffic never goes to public internet. It just stays on uh, Amazon uh, network. But one caveat here is to here, here is that uh, your data and your application has to be in same AWS region. So if your bucket is present in an AWS region, uh, then you must co-locate your application in that same region to take advantage of uh, VPC endpoints. Uh, after uh, moving to VPC endpoints, we have seen lots of lots of uh, free bandwidth on our NAT boxes, and other applications in the VPC are happy now. Um, central Docker registries, as I mentioned before, we run 2.5 million Docker containers, and uh, there are lots of different images we download from our Docker registries. Docker registries are backed by S3, so they simply send S3 redirects uh, after getting a request. But uh, so initial setup we had at Yelp was basically we had multiple Docker registries on a single host backed by an Nginx instance. Nginx was supposed to load balance across these registries. Uh, but the scale at which we were operating basically failed to cope up uh, with the number of requests we were making. Uh, we also tried to uh, put uh, registries on different uh, different hosts and you know put it put them behind ELBs. But we ran into issues with uh, sticky uh, cookies, et cetera, and we couldn't really do it. So the solution here is that we run multiple Docker registries on each agent. So Docker registry is basically a Docker container which uh, sends a redirect to S3, and it doesn't matter where it is running. So on each Siegel agent, we have two different registries running, and we use Etsy hosts to uh, basically resolve, the, resolve to local host. Um, so this has been a game changer. We have never run into any issues with uh, bandwidth or Docker registries not being able to cope up with, uh, with the number of requests we're making. Uh, I highly recommend this. If you ever have run into this issue, you should definitely try, it out, try out this solution. Uh, the second main problem is spot instances. Spot instances can be reclaimed at any point of time by Amazon. Um, so you have to make sure that your application is fault tolerant. It can deal with executors going away. It can rec recover from this, uh, from this uh, failure. So uh, what we do is we have a cron job, which is constantly uh, checking for termination notice. After getting the termination notice, we terminate all the executors that are running on the, on the agent. Our uh, scheduler gets task loss status update for each executor, and it basically reschedules them elsewhere. We also terminate Mesos agent process uh, in order to prevent it from uh, getting more tasks and basically losing those tasks. Um, so this has also worked really well for us. We have um, not run into any issues uh, with spot instances going away. Um, as you may know, spot markets are pretty volatile. Uh, bid prices for in spot instance prices can go up, down, they can fluctuate and can have an adverse impact on your application. 
So um, getting the bid price is really hard. Uh, how, how, how much money you bid on a particular instance, it's hard to determine. And the trade-off that you have here is basically availability and cost savings. If you're willing to pay more cost, then you can get more availability and vice versa. So the solution here is to make your application fault tolerant and diversify into more spot markets. So for Siegel, we use uh, th 10 different instance types and three different AZs. So we have 30 different spot markets. We use a wide range of instances, C4, I2s, M4s, uh, and basically this has uh, allowed us to you know, have a compute cluster available all the time. Uh, we also use spot fleet um, that uh, makes sure that we are never paying more than on-demand price of an instance. If uh, price of an instance goes above on-demand price, then we basically terminate those instances and we get capacity from other markets. So this allows us to uh, keep the cost down. Issues with Docker daemon. We have run into a lot of issues with Docker, uh, mainly because of Docker daemon. Uh, sometimes Docker basically gets locked up and stops responding to our requests. Uh, we've also seen deadlocks in Docker daemon. Uh, every time we upgrade Docker, we always run into some or the other issue. Uh, Docker daemon sometimes fails to resolve DNS, while other tools like Dig are working fine. We've tried different solutions like Sego DNS, et cetera, but it has not really uh, worked for us. We use AUFS our, as our reunion file system, and we are running kernel 4.2. 4 and we've often run into issues where um, it basically causes kernel panic, and our CPUs go into soft uh, CPU lockup state where we, you cannot run any task on the agent. So we basically uh, run a cron job, which periodically it SSHs to each box, and it checks a D message uh, and sees if uh, the instance has gone bad. If it has, then it goes ahead and terminates the instance. Um, but yeah, IUFS is probably one of the better uh, union file systems based on our experience. Um, orphan Docker containers. So uh, after running 2.5 million uh, Docker containers, we have had a lot of orphan containers. So uh, these, what happens is that uh, application tries to uh, remove uh, containers, but because Docker daemon is not responding, it gets an exception and just exits, and Docker containers are left behind. These containers are not account. The resources that these containers use are not accounted for in Mesos. So Mesos thinks that you know there's more room to schedule tasks on the host, and eventually our boxes run out of memory. Uh, so this used to cause a lot of issues for us, uh, and then we came up with a solution. So we wrote a tool called Docker Rocker Reaper. So it's a proxy for Docker daemon. It's written in Go. It's supposed to be transparent. So if you send a particular uh, signal to it will forward to uh, its children. And it basically cleans up Docker containers after the child process goes away. Um, so the way it works is uh, we have Mesos Executor. It creates a Docker Reaper. Uh, it basically creates a Unix socket and sets the Docker host environment variable, which is used uh, by Docker clients, doc Docker daemon. Uh, it fork execs the child process. Uh, child process then goes and creates containers. So create container uh, API call is intercepted by our proxy. It forwards the call to Docker daemon. Uh, when it gets a response back, it uh, gets the container ID. It records the container ID in memory and forwards it, forwards it to the child process. When the child process goes away, it goes ahead and removes the container. So uh, this has basically allowed us to uh, reduce the number of orphan containers. But because of various issues of Docker daemon, we still uh, are left with a few orphan containers. So uh, we run different cron jobs on the, on the agents that check which instance, uh, which Docker containers are running for more than 30 minutes. And they go ahead and remove the containers. Uh, Mesos maintenance mode. So this is a great feature that Mesos provides. But uh, unfortunately, it is uh, designed to be used by a single operator. So anytime you make a post request to this API, it will overwrite the existing maintenance schedule. So if you want to use this feature in your agents, you need to make sure that uh, only one agent is able to talk to Mesos uh, and make post requests to a particular endpoint. 
Uh, you need basically external locking to ensure that this happens. Uh, so you can use a Zookeeper-based uh, mechanism to make sure only one agent is talking to Zookeeper, uh, to Mesos. Uh, so yeah, uh, we are talking to Mesos folks, and, and we're trying to figure out if we can improve uh, the maintenance mode uh, and make it uh, usable by m multiple operators. Um, so yeah, future of Seagull. Uh, where would we like to go uh, in next year or so? We'd love to use oversubscription. Uh, so oversubscription will basically allow us to use residual capacity in the cluster and run low-priority batch workload. For example, photo classification. If there's no stringent upper bound on uh, when classification should finish, we can just uh, run it on the on the residual capacity in the cluster. We are also replacing uh, the core component of Siegel Scheduler. Siegel Scheduler was written a long time back, uh, and it needs an upgrade. So we have basically written a library called Task Processing, uh, and we are uh, replacing the scheduler with this library. Um, we would also love to use CSI plugin once it is available and replace the cluster-wide resources with this solution, which is more robust. And we delegate the responsibility of allocating cluster-wide resources to Mesos, which is great. Uh, we also want to make uh, Siegel easier, uh, easier to use, um, so more, more and more people at Yelp can uh, take advantage of parallelization that Siegel provides. Uh, executor improvements. We'd love to containerize everything. We love Docker containers. Most of our production workload uh, runs in Docker, uh, and we'd love to uh, containerize everything. Uh, we'd also uh, like to use Mesos Containerizer and Docker Runtime, and basically eliminate the need uh, to talk to Docker Daemon. This will uh, save us a lot of uh, effort and money. Uh, basically, we don't have to talk to Docker Daemon uh, after using Mesos Containerizer. So Mesos recently added this feature called Nested Containers and Pods. Uh, this is a great feature, especially for Siegel. Uh, we can use nested containerizer uh, and uh, spin up Docker containers within uh, that container. And once once our application finishes, the container will go away and it will reap all the containers that were started within the uh, nested container. So we don't have to uh, deal with often Docker containers. Um, autoscaler improvements. Uh, while our autoscaler works reasonably well right now, there are things we can do. Uh, there are better algorithms that we can use and uh, you know, drive up the utilization of our cluster. Um, right now, we are using a single spot fleet request. And this basically prevents us from using more spot markets. So with a single spot fleet request, you can only use 30 spot markets. We would like to use multiple spot, uh, spot fleets uh, and expand into more markets and see if we can uh, get more savings. Uh, and we'll also we'd also love to uh, use more instance types in our uh, Siegel cluster, so uh, that that may uh, drive down the cost. Cost. So yeah, uh, we are hiring in Europe and uh, in London and Hamburg office. Uh, we're looking for distributed uh, systems engineers and managers. If you are interested in uh, working at Yelp, please reach out to me. I can get you in touch with the people, uh, the right people. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have for this talk. Anybody has any questions? Okay. Thank you.